problem is there is no known cure, and we probably won't even treat you because we have no hope. I don't think it's an accident that the information on this has been known for 15 or 20 years. They told my parents I was going to die. No one else should have died of heart disease. We had the cure. We've had it for decades. It's going to take a radical shift in mindset. Oh, I can't blame doctors. They're not trained in this field. You know, my genes have already set my destiny. What I thought I knew about healthy eating almost killed me. Three-fourths of what we suffer from in America is due to the food that we eat. It's, it's not food to me. It's... It's torture. I think we haven't really focused on the quality of food that we take. We're more interested in convenience. Food is medicine. you got to put back into the earth in order to get back. Changing from. what I put into my body can make me live longer. Why doesn't everybody know this? About 19 years ago, we were staying at the house, getting ready for Easter the night before, dyeing Easter eggs and making cookies and setting the table. And my father and my husband were watching television. This is hard for me, I'm sorry. And in the wee hours of the morning, I heard my mom cry out that something was wrong. And we raced up to their bedroom and he was gone. He was 58 years old and he was gone. Everybody, everybody knows suffering. It's there. People are hurting and um, it's a tragedy. And um, it's important to me. Good evening. The news hit around breakfast time as a lot of Americans were sitting down in front of a plate of bacon or sausage. The obesity crisis is getting worse in America, not better. We have to cut carbon pollution in our own countries to prevent the worst effects of climate change. This undercover video shows chickens being buried alive. So you want to tell the story uh, dramatically and say, uh, you're in a hospital and decide to change your mind, you know? And um, I don't believe anything anyone says in a hospital on New Year's Eve or during sex. Those three times, uh, all information is considered invalid. Uh, everybody that goes to the hospital says, you know, from now I'm gonna eat right, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna do all this, and they're always lying. Say the same three things actually during sex and on New Year's Eve. So I was in the hospital with bad hypertension and um, I did not make any promises to change my life. I was, you know, it's probably 330 then. Uh, Got to get your weight down to about 280 where we can uh, control your blood pressure with drugs. And I said, well, is 280 where I should get down to? And then he said this sentence that um, blew my mind. And it was the first time I'd ever, something you're, you know, anybody watching this is very familiar with, but I wasn't familiar with it. He said, well, you know, if you get your weight down to 220, 230, you probably wouldn't need drugs at all. And I said, what? I'd thought that my hypertension was genetic. And he said, well, it is. And I said, well, no, you're telling me that um, the drugs that I'm taking are, tell me these are fat guy drugs. Um, I thought they were, you know, genetic drugs. He said, well, yes, of course. But I said, well, it can't be both, of course. You can't say it's genetic, and yet if I got down to this weight, I wouldn't have it. And that just bugged me. That just bugged me tremendously. We're eating ourselves into the most overweight and obese population in the history of the human race. In this country this year, we'll spend over $3 trillion on health care. Somewhere between one half and 75% of that are lifestyle-related problems. You get out of your health exactly what you put into it. And we have been putting the wrong fuel in our body. We really didn't learn much of anything about nutrition in medical school. I was really angry. I just could not understand why I didn't learn any of this. The system is set up to reimburse kind of pills and procedures. You get paid to do things for pay. You don't get paid if your patients get better. We live in a pill-popping generation. Everybody wants a pill for this or a pill for that. Big Pharma is in the business of us being sick. They fund medical education. That's what you learn about. We've never had more pills in human history. 
and yet we've never had more chronic disease. There's the food industry, which is a trillion dollar industry. There's a lot of people that are making money off processed foods. There are a lot of people that are making money off meat, a lot of people making money off dairy, and it's a huge lobbying power. Take away the supervision from the USDA and give it to another body. They're handing out subsidies with this hand, and with the other hand, they're telling the American public what to eat. You know, they don't look at meat and say, this is full of saturated fat, cholesterol, DDT, environmental contaminants, infection. Not part of the sales pitch. Dairy is the most toxic thing people put in their body. I won't even call it food. People that are eating a standard American diet don't understand, number one, the scientific implications of that in their body, but two, they often don't understand that food has enslaved them by this addictive component. Foods are the cause of diabetes, of heart disease, of many forms of cancer, of hypertension. And if they're the cause, they can also be the solution. What is on our plate is really affecting our environment. More global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. Something's wrong with this paradigm, and we need to shift paradigm to find out what works better. We're eating ourselves into our graves. Since a small child, I've had a love of plants to have this living organism within this tiny little package, a seed, and you plant it, and it, and it grows into such beauty and potential. I am a product of the state of New Jersey. I went to Rutgers, the state university, got a botany degree, and then went on to the state medical school. I received a, you know, standard academic training then went on to an internal medicine residency in uh, Washington, D.C. at George Washington. As a newly minted doctor, my father, who was an attorney, 69 years of age, uh, was suddenly diagnosed with end-stage metastatic pancreatic cancer. He was given a prognosis of one to three months to live, offered some standard treatment, uh, and because there's, you know, there's very little uh, success with that agent, my father decided to do nothing and just go home and prepare for death. I knew in my world that I'd come from, there was just nothing available. And even still to this day, there's very little available for pancreatic cancer. So I went to my local library and finally came across some books on food, brought these books home for my father. The books were on a whole unrefined plant food uh, way of eating. He grasped onto it and um, completely changed his diet. And a year later, we went back. When the doctor saw my father walk in, he looked a little bit shaken. He asked my father what he was doing there and, and why, basically, why was he still alive? My father started to tell him about broccoli and brown rice and the doctor lost complete interest. And what my father was saying, that was the point for me that changed what I would do as a doctor. Our medical community in general has really focused on symptoms of disease. We see it throughout our whole pharmaceutical industry and our whole approach to care. And you know, we have this acute care model in healthcare today. And it was designed 100 years ago to treat communicable diseases and injury. And we're still trying to treat chronic disease now with that same acute care model, but it doesn't work. We're trying to treat diabetes and heart disease the way we treat strep throat, with pills, but it doesn't work. I feel a little disenfranchised, if you will, to have gone through four years of medical school and six years of training after medical school and never been introduced to the idea that your health is so closely related to what you eat. When I entered into practice, I had patients constantly ask me, what should I eat, doc? How should I exercise? What should I do? I would throw out little arbitrary words and say, ah, 
be good the majority of the time. Live by the four sevens rule. If you do well four out of seven days, that's good enough. You know, I, I started to become troubled by that, you know, and that I was actually giving advice, professional advice to individuals when they were asking without a fund of knowledge. Everybody knows that doctors don't get any really meaningful education about nutrition. Nutrition is really something that maybe you get one hour, maybe you get two hours. Nutrition in the 1970s in my medical school was very, very limited. I really still feel that it, it's, it's, it's nearly criminal. There really haven't been many opportunities to discuss nutrition in depth because the topic only comes up in passing. Maybe they assumed that we knew the average physician in this country has less than 20 minutes of nutrition training, period. Well, nobody teaches you anything about nutrition in medical school. What I was taught was nobody changes their diet anyway, so just, you know, do what you can. I hate to say it, but your physician probably knows less about nutrition than you do. We're taught to treat diseases after they occur. We're not taught how to prevent them in the first place. I think that people, that society in general, has a broken relationship with food. Uh, we're a society that's chronically fed from the time we get up in the morning until the time we go to bed. And when you think about it, the only species that are obese and chronically ill are us and the pets we keep warm and fed. And they get exactly the same diseases. If you eat the same things that most Americans eat, you're gonna get the same diseases that most Americans get. I'm a steak guy. Fish. Sushi, actually. I like meat. Anything protein-based. Steak, potatoes, greens. Good cheese. I don't, I don't really eat processed cheese. Lasagna. Hamburgers, french fries. Red Bull and a cigarette, which I don't need neither or. But you know what? I'm so old now, I'm just going to do it anyway. It's sad, but I, can, I think I can say this honestly. Probably 95% of America has no idea how to eat. Who taught them? Grandma? No, it's the television that's teaching them. Nutritious, delicious. Above all else, beef. It's what's for dinner. Got milk? Ah, the power of cheese. Eggs. Incredible energy for body and mind. Well, I grew up in Texas eating meat four or five times a day, you know, and I liked it. I ate a high salt, sugar, fat, processed food, pizza, ice cream, candy kind of diet. I was a pretty much a standard cholesterol holic that grew up on a <laughs> dairy and a, and a beef farm. We loved our cheese, we loved our ice cream and yogurt and steaks and hamburgers on the grill. Grew up on a dairy farm, actually milking cows, but believing along the way that the good old American diet was as good as it gets. Certain foods are essential. We must have them daily for the sake of health. Meat, cheese, fish, poultry, vegetables, green and yellow, fruits, two or more servings daily, at least one raw citrus fruit or tomato often, and eggs, three to five a week, but one a day preferred. Cereal and bread, rich golden butter, and milk at least one quart of milk a day. I've come to see aging in America as a function of accumulated abuse of the human body. Then everybody gather around and dig into those sizzly, juicy Armor Star Franks. Hot dog diggity, are they good? Armor Star Franks. Because Wonder Soft Whipped Bread is made from batter, not dough. It has no holes. Get Wonder Soft Whipped. One of the main reasons that we started eating processed food was it encouraged the shelf life of the product. We were taught that these packaged foods were healthier and they were easier and they made our lives better. And many times it was a white refined food. But of course, Refined means about 97% of the fiber is gone, and enriched means most of the nutrients have been stripped out, but we've sprayed a few synthetic chemicals back on for you, and now we call it enriched. Our parents, you know, God bless them, they didn't know any better. The information wasn't out there. Meat and potatoes, that's, that's how you live. This summer, try our new grilled chicken margarita pizza. Who knew crab goes with everything? Whoever put crab on this salmon? On a burger. And don't forget the bacon and onions seared inside fresh ground beef. Introducing Grill Dogs. Flame grilled to perfection and made with 100% beef. Get them now, only at Burger King. The standard American diet is not working. 
it's not good for us. I think we haven't really focused on the quality of food that we take. We're more interested in convenience. I mean, the whole fast food thing on television, you know, all the pizza commercials, burger commercials, just fast food that you make at home, stuff you take off the shelf and you pour it out of a box and put some water in it. You got an instant meal here. It's like, oh my God, are we killing ourselves? Early on in this process, I, it was, it was kind of confusing because I would read a study that would say, this is good for you, and then another one would say, no, that's actually bad for you, something else is good for you. So the industry just has to keep the public confused, which they've been doing a very good job at. I was so misinformed as a young adult that I didn't know how to eat properly and I didn't know how to balance my diet. I was, you know, eating what I thought was health food, you know, salmon, big hunks of salmon. I think it can get confusing to the general public because all they hear are sensationalized headlines about, oh, this fat is good for you, this fat is bad for you, you want a high protein diet, stay away from carbohydrates. Well, we don't eat food like that. We eat food. All that we need is enough confusion and then people that throw up their hands, and I'll oh, forget it, I'll just do whatever I want to do. Drink your milk for strong bones and teeth, and it turns out to be exactly the wrong way around. And almost a little betrayed that we'd been told our whole lives that we had to eat you know, animal protein and drink milk in order to be healthy. But that's what we grew up with as a, as a culture, so we can't be blamed for it, but we have to break those, those habit patterns. I wasn't born obese. Um, I was fit and healthy as a kid up until I was 24 years old. But from the time, uh, the age of 24 to the age of 30, I got up as heavy as 518 pounds. I would love to say that, you know, I know why or how, but I don't. All I know is that I got there and it was extremely difficult. In June of 2013, my wife Iris and I decided to take my then six-year-old son for his birthday to Florida. Two weeks prior to the trip, my son and I went through online and looked at all the rides, and he decided that the Harry Potter ride was the most epic ride in the history of rides, and he wanted me to ride it with him. And if you've ever been on a ride, they have a sample of the seating as you approach the ride platform. One of the people that worked there asked me to step out of line to try the seating. As soon as I sat down, it was apparent that this wasn't going to happen. It was his birthday. Sorry. He, uh, he begged. He cried. And I couldn't fit. My wife practically drug him onto the ride. And in that moment, I realized that I couldn't live like that anymore. Wow. Well, well, just two. Well, eat. Eating to excess. You've got far too many sausages, Billy. Will you put some back? There are fresh concerns about our globally expanding waistlines. Experts had thought the obesity rate had leveled off, and they don't know why it's rising instead. The new report also shows women have a higher level of obesity than men. The reason people get fat is because they eat fat. I, you know, from my lips to my hips, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. There's unfortunately been a lot of uh, articles written recently, mostly by non-physicians and non-scientists, saying, you know, Americans have been told to eat less fat, uh, they're eating less fat, they're fatter than ever, so, you know, if low fat has failed, bring out the bacon and eggs. Well, I went to the U.S. Department of Agriculture database and said, I know that Americans have been told to eat less fat, but what have we actually been eating? Well, it turns out that every decade since 1950, we've been eating more fat, more meat, more sugar, and more calories. So, not surprisingly, we're fatter. The biggest portion of Americans are in the obese category now. It's unbelievable. And the, the people who have a very small minority of people that have a normal weight. It just goes, it goes from the spoon, right to your hips and uh, belly, and actually it goes there so effortlessly, you can take a needle and suck the fat out, take it to the lab, analyze it, and you can tell what people like to eat. You suck your belly fat out and it's full of monounsaturated fats and they're into olive oil. If it's full of uh, trans fats, they're into margarines and shortenings. If they're full of omega-3 fats, then they're into eating fish. 
People worry about if they're 10 pounds too heavy, 50 pounds too heavy, but they're not thinking about the impact of the weight as it pertains to their actual health and well-being and their risk for disease. I want to enjoy my kids, enjoy my grandkids. I cannot imagine missing one thing. Going into this massive change, um, of course, I'd love to lose weight, but more importantly, I just want to be healthy. And they say, doctor, I've tried everything. I'm miserable. I'll go, well, have you tried eating something different? Or tell me what you've done with your nutrition. I'm changing what I put in my body, but that's what I've known for 36 years, so it's very scary. Up until recently, we didn't really think of nutrition as being a very strong force. Eat a little bit less carbs and nothing much happens, or you count calories for a few weeks and you lose a few pounds and then you gain it all back. And I think people have gotten used to the idea that food doesn't make much difference. My family surrounds celebrations, um, sad things, bad things. Everything revolves around food. You know, you go to a funeral and after the funeral, people get together, they eat, and and they eat the same kind of things that help put the person in the casket in the first place. Uh, so it's, it's really part of, of, of who we are. The thought of giving up sugar, not being able to eat my waffle with syrup and a side of bacon, that is, I mean, that just makes my stomach turn. It's that nervous feeling of like when you are starting a new job or you're going from elementary school to middle school. That's how I feel about changing my food. Because food is something primal. It's the first bond and love we create after we're being born. And looking into old age, for many of us, it's the last pleasure we're left with on this earth. I think you could save all the testing people do by taking a tub of movie popcorn and putting it under someone's nose and saying, does that smell good? And if they say yes, you need to get them to a hospital and save their lives. And if they say no, they're healthy. I think that's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. I think a lot of people understand fruits and vegetables are good for you but they don't know how good the good stuff is, and they have no idea how bad the bad stuff is. I think the addiction to food is bigger than the combination of the addiction that people have to cigarettes, alcohol, coffee, drugs. I truly see how food can completely control someone's life, that you literally obsess over it, and it's, Understandable, when you get in your car and you drive somewhere, how many fast food places do you go by? How many billboards do you see? You are bombarded all day long and just filled with temptation. It's like an alcoholic. I can't have one drink. I can't have that one candy bar a week because I didn't have an off switch. Most of the restaurants have very easily figured out that if you add cheese and butter and salt to everything, it tastes good. And so you come back over and over again. And the same thing is true for a lot of the snack foods and candies. They're just perfectly tweaked to be delicious. So if we just look at like the average American diet, when we put in sugar, fat, and salt into our body, a couple of things happen. First, it triggers the reward system in our brain, the dopamine reward system, just like nicotine, methamphetamine, and cocaine. So they have the same effect, creating some dependence or food addiction. Drug addicts often have this thing where they call chasing the dragon. It's the elusive first high. No other high is as good as this first high. And so they're constantly chasing it. And I've experienced that with food. Like the first bite is so amazing, but the second isn't as amazing and the third isn't. But I just keep eating it, whether it's the Oreos or the chocolate chip cookies or the ice cream, just trying to get back to that first bliss. What's sweet out in nature? Sweet potatoes, berries, fruit, healthy food. Foods, right? And so, but now the industry uses that natural, healthy urge against us, right? They're chemists that spend their whole lives, you know, working on the bliss point. The ripest peach in the world is not as sweet as Fruit Loops, right? Within just a couple of hours of eating these foods, it's absorbed into the bloodstream and then it penetrates our cell. Sugar causes measurable inflammation inside of our artery walls causing damage to the lining of the artery, the endothelial cells. 
making us more susceptible to atherosclerosis and even more susceptible to inflammation that can lead to cancer. We also know that within a couple of hours of eating sugar, it suppresses our immune system and it's specifically the natural killer cells that help us to fight infections. And that can suppress our immune system for four to five hours. So if we kind of understand this, you know, Americans having sugar-based breakfast, sugar-based lunch, and sugar-based dinner, they're suppressing their immune system throughout the course of the day, making themselves more susceptible to these infections that we encounter. Realize that we are going to go through a chemical addictive withdrawal for probably three or four days, depending on the food and the frequency and the quantity at which you ate it. If you feel a little bit bloated or a little gassy or a lot gassy, or you're going with more um, frequency, it's not to be concerned about. Let it pass, let your body sort of work itself out. I know it's tough in the beginning. I know food addictions and, and I call it toxic hunger could make you feel bad when you're kind of like breaking those addictions. You could feel fatigue, you could feel weak and headache. You could feel like you're emotionally attached to those foods and having almost a feeling of um, anxiety giving up the foods you've come to love. Oh, I can't live without me. Well, yeah, you can. I always say go cold turkey, even if it's just for a short period of time. Go cold turkey for 21 days. Mm -hmm. Because the whole tapering off thing, it doesn't work with addiction. We're addicted to meat, we're addicted to dairy, there are opiates and cheeses and things like that. Plus we're just addicted to our habit patterns that we grew up with. Imagine back in the 1950s, before the Surgeon General report on smoking came out, and one doctor's telling you to smoke camels, the other doctor's saying, no, smoke Luckies instead. And so in 1964, when the Surgeon General report came out, they cited 7,000 studies about the dangers of smoking. 7,000, now look, 6,000 should have been enough, right? But, I mean, it had to get to that point before it could tip. And how many people had to die until that happened? And so I think we're in a very similar situation today. My story starts a long time ago with a lot of issues with overeating and it escalated many, many times up and down, a lot of yo-yo dieting. Finally, at 380 pounds and diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and hypertension on medication, I decided to make a commitment to a completely different lifestyle of eating. I was in my 49th year and it occurred to me I wasn't gonna see 50. It was a lot of sitting on the couch, watching a lot of television and eating. And everyone didn't always see the eating because I did that after they left for school or before, you know, in the car, there was a lot of secretive eating going on. You want to believe that there is no addiction, that this is a metabolic thing and that, you know, this can be fixed. But, you know, when you start to find that, you know, the trappings of wrappers and... I knew. I mean, it's, you know, I knew what was happening. I, I knew about all the things that they didn't know about. You know, you say to yourself, okay, at this time, maybe I'm 40-something years old and, you know, okay, I'm going to have all these kids. I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to take care of them if she's not around. Every day, I thought that they were gonna find me dead in the parking lot because I was out of breath just walking from my car to my office every day. There were a lot of things that I didn't know, I didn't understand. You know, I'm like, oh, if I could just do the math on this, it'll be better, but there is no math to this. I couldn't do many things, and I didn't do many things because of the shame and embarrassment. I didn't want to embarrass my kids. People, people make fun of them, but they don't exist, you know? and they do exist. I was morbidly obese my entire adult life. Being obese uh, sucks. You know that people are looking at you. You can only imagine what they're thinking about you even though they're too polite. I was eating what most Americans consider to be a healthy diet with lean protein, so I was pretty much down to chicken and salmon as my protein. But we were cooking those proteins in butter and olive oil, and obviously it was not working. I have tried every fad diet that there was, low-carb South Beach Atkins Weight Watchers, to try to lose weight, and I discovered what a lot of people have, which is as long as you're doing these diets, they work great. Problem is, when you stop dieting, all the weight comes back and often more than you were in the first place. Wisdom is the process of finding out that your intuition is wrong. It's not easy to have to learn something that goes against your instincts. For example, people have a feeling when they're sitting in a car that 
they're not in danger if they don't have their seatbelt on. That was sort of the way people felt in the 1950s and 60s. So your intuition doesn't understand that you're sitting in a two-ton vehicle going 50 miles an hour and that you are actually helpless. I thought I ate super healthy. The truth is that I was completely wrong, but the, the type of information that I could find available to me said that these, these foods were actually good for me. I thought I was healthy because I didn't have meat in my diet, I didn't have milk in my diet, I didn't have eggs, I didn't have cheese, but I was eating all this other junk full of oil and sugar and salt and all of that. I filled my body with protein and calories. Uh, little did I know what it was doing to my body at that time, but I continued to eat that way all the way up through the 94 Olympics when I was competing and thought nothing of going to a fast food restaurant and eating two hamburgers and a couple orders of fries and a chocolate milkshake. I had the idea that it had no consequences for me to eat this kind of food because I looked and felt great. Well, I'm thin. I don't really need to think about that. I don't need to think of plant-based. That's for someone who's, ob you know, obese or overweight. But the reality is that it's not so much about the weight because the weight is really a symptom of what's happening on the inside. And many times that symptom goes unnoticed. I was just kind of your typical kid. I was on the yearbook. I played volleyball. So we, we really had no idea that anything was coming or that anything was wrong. When I was 16 years old, I was told that I had six months to live. So the first clue that something was actually wrong was one, uh, one weekend I had gone to the Jersey Shore with my friends. But I remember we went to a diner and I had these pancakes and I literally, I could not get the pancakes in my mouth, it hurt so bad. And the next morning I woke up and this excruciating pain that felt like it would take weeks to heal was gone. But the strange thing was that same exact identical pain was in my left shoulder. And after a couple of days, it disappeared from that arm too. Not long after that, migraine started. I had this huge rash across my face, going from one cheek across my nose to the other side. My blood test showed that my kidneys were in trouble, so they, they sent me in for a kidney biopsy. So next thing I know, I'm going into surgery. Uh, so it was just kind of, it was just so chaotic. And, um, and, you know, the doctor told us what happened, and they said, you know, you're in stage four kidney failure. And you've got six months if we don't do something really, really aggressive. Uh, six months, you'll be in dialysis or you'll be dead. So I was put on high-dose steroids. It was about seven different pills I had to take every day. And I also was put on experimental chemotherapy to try to save my kidneys. I was told I couldn't have kids. I was told I probably wouldn't live past my 50s. I'd probably be handicapped by my 30s. Well, with lupus, your immune system's attacking your own body. And so my, my immune system had suddenly stopped recognizing my kidneys as my own and were attacking my kidneys, trying to kill it. I'd also developed blood clots that had happened when I was in medical school. And so I was taking blood thinners because I had experienced a mini stroke, a transient ischemic attack. And thankfully, I didn't damage my brain, but I was in a lot of danger of dying at that point uh, if I didn't use this blood thinner for the rest of my life. Otherwise, you know, I was trucking through. I, I was two months away from graduating medical school. And then I met this most amazing person, Thomas Tadlock, and he just changed everything for me. And I went from only dreaming about a white coat to dreaming about a white dress. And the hardest thing I ever had to do was to tell him about my illness. And the fact that marrying me was, you know, not gonna be long term. And uh, he, you know, it was hard for him to hear but he just said that he'd rather have a short life with me than a lifetime with someone else. So he would take care of me. If you need a surgery or if you're in an accident and you need diagnostics, the United States is the place to be. But if you want to prevent chronic disease, we're near the bottom of the list. We're taught to trust the medical field and take the medicine they prescribe to us. Really, I grew up thinking that drugs, things like that from the doctor, were the normal thing to do and that that's what would cure you. And unfortunately, the pills aren't the answer, because if they were the answer, we've never had more pills in human history, and yet we've never had more chronic disease. We need education more than medication, and our doctors are not getting this in medical school, and if they're not, then you're not getting it. We are very focused on procedures and medications. Medical school is pharmacology. In fact, we even learned about pharmacology during lunch. We get take out what are called drug lunches by pharmaceutical reps. Pharmaceutical industry is like any other industry in America. 
They're there to make money and produce profits. They fund medical education, and that's what you learn about. These medications, you don't get them for free. You pay a price for using medications, and they work as a permission slip. They enable people to think because their numbers look better, they're okay, while the underlying pathology advances day after day. So in a sense, they give people a false sense of security that leads them to give them permission to keep eating the same diet that caused the problem to begin with, and the inevitable consequence is their disease gets worse and worse and worse. But don't take it if you, or if you, and it might cause, you know, rectal bleeding, and your eye might fall out, and hey, you might even want to kill yourself. <laughs> it's kind of like, really? But it's gonna make me feel better, but I might want to kill myself. I think I'll feel the way I'm feeling. I'm okay. Look, big pharma is one of the most profitable industries. The reason they're not uh, researching new antibiotics, things that we need, is because it's taken for 10 days. That's not useful. No, we want drugs. You should take every single day for the rest of your life, right? And what are those? Those are chronic disease drugs, right? High blood pressure medications, for example, right? You have to take them every day for the rest of your life because they don't treat the underlying cause of the disease. The pill companies don't make money when you're healthy, they make money when you're sick. There's no profit in health. They need to keep you in that kind of zombie state in between where you're just shoveling more and more meds until you basically tap out. That's how the game works and that's what's stacked against you. I'm skeptical about the medical community because I know they're pill pushers and it's just part of what they do. The pharmaceutical community has their hooks way too deeply in the, in the government and the regulatory system. Approximately 106,000 people die from drug side effects. And now that's just in hospitals, and that's just one year. And these are drugs that are properly prescribed and taken as directed. These are not medical errors. These are not suicide attempts. These are not mistakes. These are drugs that were prescribed exactly right and taken exactly as ordered. And we're killing 106,000 a year. Now that's a lot. That's a million people in 10 years. When you're young, you think you're invincible. You don't think what you're going to eat is going to really hit you down the road. Really didn't start thinking about it much until my dad had a heart attack and then had quadruple bypass. And then, you know, you start thinking, well, uh-oh, you know, he's got a problem, so. So today we're going to see Andre with high cholesterol. His cholesterol report shows that his uh, total cholesterol is 189 on medication. With a whole food plant-based diet, we can take that cholesterol level below 150 without medication. And that's gonna be one of our goals. I'm controlling my cholesterol now and my triglycerides with medication, but a lot of the research I've done on the medications I'm on is not very positive. And they have side effects, and I've suffered some of the side effects. If I'm gonna be on this for a long time, is there a better way? If, if I can do it through a dietary means, which would allow me to get off of these drugs completely, that would be the optimal goal. Well, for me to change anything, I'm gonna to have to have that proof to where through this diet, it will put me, my triglycerides in the safe range, my cholesterol in the safe range, and hopefully the cholesterol um, ratios, good to bad, within an acceptable range. I'm open-minded to see what happens, uh, give it a shot, see if it works. I mean, what you have to lose. Pythagoras and Socrates was talking about this in Hippocrates 2,500 years ago. The healthiest cultures on the planet, without exception, were plant-based. I don't think it's an accident that the information on this has been known and is now just bubbling up. Then you have to ask the question, you know, why, why are we so oblivious to all of this? That gets to the questions concerning, obviously, governance. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, whose mandate is to promote agricultural products. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's what they do. At the same time, we put them in charge of protecting public safety by meat inspections and, you know, nutrition guidelines. How the government's telling us what to eat is through what they, what they subsidize. And so that's what people eat because people eat what's inexpensive. What foods are subsidized? 
Well, we're going broke, so shouldn't we be subsidizing healthy food? So are we making apples cheaper? Are we out making kale cheaper? No, the subsidies go to the sugar industry and goes to feed crops, primarily to feed livestock. So you can actually get kind of below cost of production Thanks to our tax dollars, we are giving billions of dollars to the livestock industry so you can make dollar menu burgers. In 2014, I had the privilege to be invited to testify in front of the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in Washington, D.C. Out of the 46 speakers invited, 42 represented industry. First, Americans who consume the recommended amounts of dairy foods are better able to meet key nutrient recommendations, including calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. In fact, it's difficult for most Americans to meet these nutrient recommendations without consuming at least three servings of dairy foods daily. We know quite well that a lot of these policy decisions and uh, political decisions are being made through financial considerations with people with big money, uh, big companies, big CEOs, and big Washington connections. And so when it comes to eat more messaging, like eat more fruits and vegetables, they come out and say it. But when it comes to eat less messaging, well, then there's a conflict, right? And so what do they do? They don't actually mention foods, God forbid. They say, you know, eat less saturated and trans fatty acids. Now that's wink, wink, nudge, nudge, code for eat less, you know, meat and dairy. And that's the sources of saturated fat, particularly cheese and chicken in this country. But they can't come out and say, eat less Cheetos. They can't come out and say, eat less meat, eat less dairy. They would get hammered. Dairy is one of the strongest lobbies as far as food production in this country goes. They have the most money and they will use it ruthlessly. There's not an asparagus lobby that I'm aware of. There's no money in telling people to put the burger down and have a broccoli spear. The USDA had a had an internal newsletter that promoted Meatless Monday. So once a week for your health, for the environment, consider, you know, reducing meat consumption. And there was such a political firestorm to that radical proposition that it was retracted within hours. Um, and, you know, I think that was just a lesson that you can't even go there. Doesn't matter what the science says. You know, money talks in Washington. The dogma in the nutrition industry, if you open up the fitness magazines and if you open up the bodybuilding magazines especially, is like you will never succeed unless you eat as much animal products as you possibly can. So I was terrified at first. I was like, okay, I want to be healthy, but I don't know what's going to happen. That's the first question anyone asks when you tell them that you're a plant-based athlete is like, where do you get your protein? It's funny that protein is an issue because number one, people don't know what it is. Number two, they don't recognize it in food. The whole protein thing is such a myth. It's a mainstream propaganda thing by these dairy and animal companies that throw this thing out there that the amount of protein you need in your body. Standing in front of you, it's obviously not a hindrance in bodybuilding to eat whole plant foods. So what's the problem with so much protein? It can damage our kidneys. Some um, even cancers will grow or exacerbate because of high levels of protein. And for somebody who's absolutely stuck on protein, that's their big issue. I'm not sure I'm going to get enough. Get in your car, go to the nearest rural area, pick out the biggest bull that you can find. Then go to the nearest racetrack, find the fastest, biggest, most muscular stallion. Go to the zoo, look at the tallest giraffe, the biggest elephant, and all of those animals with rippling muscles are vegans. They are getting all of the protein they need entirely from plant sources. And you will too. If you go back 10,000 years, you look at old skeletons, fossils, people had no cavities. People have these perfect teeth. You go back and think, well, wait a second, they never brushed a day in their lives. No Listerine, no water pick, no flossing. Yeah, but no candy bars. I mean, so before the invention of the candy bar, they're perfect. I mean, wait, you think our bodies would have evolved to like have our teeth fall out? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, but so cavities are completely preventable through diet. We say, well, wait a second, if they're completely preventable, why do people continue to get cavities? Well, people like dessert that kind of outweighs the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine, right? Look, I 
you know, enjoy the occasional indulgence. I got a good dental plan, right? right? But what if instead of the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the atherosclerotic plaque building up inside of our arteries, right? Then what are the consequences for you and your family? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking literally life or death. If you had told me the stuff I know now affects my health, I would have thought you were crazy. I was 57. I thought I was too young to have a stroke. When Pam and I got married, I weighed 140. As I got older, that increased about, I don't know, 10 pounds a year or so. When I had my stroke, I was at 240, 240, almost 250. He didn't know how to do anything. He didn't know me as his wife. According to my wife, I had the mentality of about a three-year-old. Even to go to take a shower or a bath, he wasn't sure what to do. He'd just go in and he'd stand. When I had my stroke, they diagnosed that I had had diabetes, and I was untreated for approximately 10 years. Pretty soon, the doctor sat me down. He tore off my chart after my stress test was going on, and he says, do you see anything wrong with that? And he handed it to the doctor. When that was done, they came out and said, we need to do immediate surgery. I was pretty high risk because I'd had a stroke. And the way I looked at it, if I didn't have the surgery, I was going to die anyhow. He came through the heart surgery. He did good. But he, he still never got any better. I had a stroke. I had to live with that. I was diabetic. I had to live with that. And I had a basket of pills. I had to live with that. Every 34 seconds, someone in the United States has a heart attack. And in case you haven't heard, one in three women will die of heart disease. I didn't go into medicine to help people get a little bit better here, a little bit better there. I really wanted transformational change, and I was becoming disillusioned. It's the whole mindset of our medical culture. We're taught as medical students and physicians to treat the bad outcomes of our horrific health habits. I used to work every Christmas and Easter. Six to eight hours after that big holiday meal, we would see the strokes. We would see the heart attack. It was just amazing. Nobody put these things together and says, dear Lord, people are eating themselves to death. My blood sugar was 441. I had five blockages. Two of them were 100%. Two was 80 and one was 70%. I was on 13 pills a day and two shots. I had seven stents in my original right coronary artery. They just kind of dismissed that it was anything to do with food, that it was more family genetics, that um, I had a double whammy because I was diabetic. Since the days of Hippocrates, there's almost been a basic covenant of trust between the caregiver and the patient that wherever possible, the caregiver is going to share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. And today in cardiology, generally that's just not being done at all. Not at all. We cut people open, we bypass their clogged arteries, we tell them they were cured, and more often than not, they would go home and do all the things that had caused the problem in the first place, you know, smoke and eat junk food. And more often than not, the bypasses would clog up and we'd cut them open again, sometimes two or three times. And so for me, we were literally bypassing the problem. We weren't really treating the underlying cause. If you had a nail stuck in the bottom of your shoe, and every time you step down, it hurts your foot because that nail's poking your foot. I could give you some Tylenol or Advil and say, well, just keep going on. Or I could say, I believe we found the cause. Let's remove that nail from your shoe and you don't need any medication. That's the way it is with a whole food plant-based diet. As a youngster, my own family had a lot of health issues. And as a kid, I remember my two favorite uncles having to have bypass surgery. And these were people who I loved and they were never the same after the surgery. And then one day, I started waking up with the most severe pains in the morning. I just knew something was really bad, but I kept thinking, maybe it'll just go away. You know, I just wanted to believe anything, but oh my goodness, I've got some heart issues. I went to the Cleveland Clinic. I had 100% on my right artery blocked, and two at 65%. I had a hardening of the right side of the artery. I also had left bundle block 
I had an enlarged heart, I had leaky valves, I was a real mess. Even though we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug or a new laser or something really high-tech and expensive, in our studies over the last almost 40 years now, we've used these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. And we found for the first time that not only can you help prevent disease, but you can actually reverse it in most cases. What Ornish showed, 1990, in the most prestigious medical journal in the world, he could measure and show that the arteries were opening up without drugs, without surgery, just, uh, you know, plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle changes. After that publication, no one else should have died of heart disease. We had the cure, we've had it for decades, yet hundreds of thousands of people continue to die from this preventable, treatable, reversible disease. The catheter is again in the aorta, now in the left main, and injecting dye into the left main, and if you look very closely, I'll slow it down, you can see there's a significant narrowing of the vessel right here. See, this is a normal vessel here. This is a circumflex vessel. And if you look right here, it's very hazy, and so that's a cholesterol plaque um, that uh, is limiting the flow significantly down this vessel. So the patient comes in with a heart attack or comes in with chest pain. Most of what I do are coronary bypass grafts. You know, Oklahoma is number two in the nation for death from cardiovascular disease. And it's because of the way we eat. There's no question about it. About six years ago, I woke up with left arm pain. I went to my cardiologist. My cholesterol was 494. My triglycerides were over 3,200. I had a stress test. It was abnormal. I had a 85% blockage of my left anterior descending, an 80% a little further downstream, and a 70% of my right main coronary. And he said that it was too big to stent, so he recommended I have a triple bypass. It was like a slap in the face, because it just never crossed my mind that that would happen. So many of our friends had, you know, had this happen, and they went in and they had the stents, and they were fine, and that was what we were gonna do, you know? So it was, it was a real wake-up call. One of my partners recommended that I read the China study. I had read that the Saturday before the arteriogram, and in that book is mentioned Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Dr. Esselstyn. And so I found that book, read it literally that day, called my cardiologist and said, uh, I think I want to try diet before I have bypass. And it literally scared him to death. Don't let your culture hold your heart hostage. Hey, it's in the family genes. I'm going to get it. I'm going to die of something. Why not let me eat what I want to eat and enjoy life? I hear that all the time. It's very common for people who have a family history of heart disease to have a family history of eating a very poor, low nutritive quality diet, high in junk food, high in salt, sugar, and fat. One of my sites that I work at is a heart hospital. I see patients that come in there not infrequently who are about my age, built like me, that come in with heart attacks. They're thin and healthy on the outside, but on the inside, their arteries are filled up with saturated fat and cholesterol and inflammation. They are, they're very surprised by it when it happens, but I see how my friends eat after a bike ride, for instance. Exercise is great for many different reasons, but exercise alone is not enough. And a plant-based lifestyle is incredibly beneficial because it reduces the risk of so many diseases that affect us. The whole truth will come out one of these days. Truth cannot be suppressed for too long. Erectile dysfunction to a urologist is ED, but when a cardiologist hears ED, that's early death. Erectile dysfunction is um, sort of the, the bad boy on the block because nobody wants to talk about it. But in general, the statistics are pretty earth-shattering, right? Roughly 40% of men at age 40, 50 at 50, 60 at 60, and then by the time we're 100, we're all in trouble. The problem is, when a person develops ED, that's the first sign that there's some problem 
in the blood vessels. The pathophysiology is the same as coronary artery disease. The, the obstruction of the arteries to the penis by plaques that develop in there. There are much smaller arteries going to the penis than to your heart, and that's why we typically see those symptoms develop first. Most people don't realize that cardiovascular disease is a systemic disease process. That means if you have a heart attack, you're at risk for ED and peripheral arterial disease and stroke and dementia. And so in short, people need to realize that when they have a stent and they fix one little area, it does not cure the problem. It simply solves one little spot. And so ED is no different. It's kind of a warning signal that, well, that's not working well. And if that's not working well, we know you're not getting the oxygen supply to your brain and to your heart. Where cardiovascular disease has its inception is when we progressively destroy the capacity of our life jacket and our guardian, which is the innermost layer of the artery the endothelium. The damage to the endothelium begins when an excess LDL cholesterol is absorbed into the artery walls. The resulting inflammatory response triggers immune cells called macrophages. They enter the vessel wall and begin to gobble up the excess cholesterol, creating these foam cells. Now these large cholesterol-laden foam cells accumulate, resulting in plaque buildup from the inside out, causing a pimple-like area to bulge into our artery passageways. Over time, the covering of these pimples can rupture, triggering a blood clot that can block normal blood flow to an area, resulting in a heart attack or a stroke. Back in 1900, we consumed about four pounds of oil per person per year, currently 74 pounds. So we have added a tremendous amount of oil to our lives. All oil is 120 calories a tablespoon. And most Americans consuming between 250 and 700 calories of oil a day. You're taking the oil, removing it from the original item, whether it be an olive, whether it be a soybean, whether it be coconut, and you're isolating that oil out. When you isolate that oil, you have 100% fat. Fats and oils are a major contributor to blocked heart arteries, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, heart attacks, heart failure. Oil injures endothelial cells. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in bread, oil in a salad dressing. So I have a number of people, even on a plant-based diet, that will come in and say, Dr. Stoll, I'm eating really well, but I'm still gaining weight. And my first question to them is, well, how much olive oil, coconut oil, et cetera, are you using in your diet? When they start to add it up, sometimes they're adding five, six tablespoons a day. So here we are, you know, six, 700 calories. They're adding to their diets and they don't realize it because they're adding in oils that they assume are healthy. There aren't some special oils you can buy that are health promoting. They're all processed foods with almost no levels of micronutrients and phytochemicals in them, with no fiber. Coconut oil, is 90% saturated fat. Lard is 43% saturated fat. The coconut oil miracle is that it's still on the market. And so when we just hear little clips on the news, maybe on the internet, says olive oil's the way to go, we grab onto that. And unfortunately, it's bad information. Here I am, I'm just out of recovery from the heart catheter. And he looks at me, he says, you know, I think I'd like you to meet Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. He was my mentor at medical school. Sure enough, the next morning he gave me a call. He said, I want you to read this book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, and call me back. There is hard science out there that you can halt and reverse this disease with nutrition. There's a common feeling that, oh, well, patients won't do that. Well, that's nothing is further from the truth. I read it, within a few days I called him back, and I said, I'm in. I'll do whatever you want me to do. When folks are willing to change their, you know, 50, 60, 70 year old worth of habits, it's amazing watching Cure for the first time in my career. I really believe that diet is the primary way that we need to change things. I've been now plant-based for almost three years. What it's done is at that time, my cholesterol was 310. Today it's at 143. Plant-based nutrition has allowed me to have more energy than I've ever felt in my life. The body is a natural self-healing machine, and disease is unnatural, avoidable, and in most cases, reversible with superior nutrition.